Thank you very much, uh, Wakar, as Deputy Vice-Chancellor. Thank you, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I do have some friends in the audience, too, which I wasn't expecting, so I'm really delighted. Um, I obviously am extremely honored to be asked to de deliver this lecture, but unusually for me, I'm a little nervous, too. Um, I haven't done this kind of formal stuff much uh, in my life in recent years. I want to uh, just quickly, um, Gwaka's done some of it, but uh, this idea of an insider-outsider, in some ways just a very um, um, kind of way of complimenting myself, I suppose, because I, I am this person who is an insider-outsider, not out of choice. I would very much, given a chance, given a choice, love to be Andrew Marr, but I'm not. Um, life and fate gave me another history, another identity. Um, I came to this country when I was 23, all already formed, brought up in Africa as an Indian, feeling African but not really being African, feeling Indian but never having been to India or Pakistan, Pakistan where my father came from, then coming here. Um, and always walking this line of, of being an insider, outsider, um, which as I get older, I now see as something, some kind of privilege, as well as a tough journey to have undertaken, um, some of it not in my hands. So yes, I came as an exile. Um, I am a woman. Uh, an immigrant, a very proud immigrant, a very proud immigrant, who will always be proud of being an immigrant um, and what immigration has meant to this country and to me. Um, I'm a, a Muslim, but uh, one that drinks wine and fasts, so work that one out if you will. Um, talk about insider outsiders. I try to be a good person, but there is this, this, this kind of composite person and a biography that I think gave me this, this uh, position. But the best thing of all is that I came to a country, I suppose, where journalism it was, and although it's dying, still is such an important part of people's lives. I mean, the saddest thing is that even in Britain, which traditionally, um, was the most excited and interested in newsprint than any other European country or any North American country. It started here a long time ago, and the idea of, of this thing in your hand goes back a very long way. Um, and I, growing up in the empire, and my father, who really uh, was an extremely um, intelligent man, but not a very reliable man, used to spend all the family money that we didn't have on newspapers. He was an addict. Cigarettes and newspapers. I grew up with this atmosphere in the house and my mother nagging him all the time um, because you know they'd spent the last cents on, on another newspaper. It wasn't just one newspaper, it would be many newspapers. And remember, this was a time um, when there was no freedom of press. People forget, people forget that in the empire, in the colonial countries ruled by Britain, there was no freedom of press. There was heavy censorship. Um, it, 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 when Indian films used to be shown in Uganda, the British censors, both in India and in Uganda, would, for example, cut out any seen with a man wearing a loincloth because they thought that reminded people of Gandhi and then people they would become revolutionaries. You know, they would take out, they would not allow anything through which hadn't passed through censors. It was ridiculous. Um, so I grew up both with this love of newspapers but also a very strong understanding of what was allowed and what was not allowed. Um, you know, the heavy hand of empire was on us. Um, all the time. If you went to the cinema, you had to stand up when God Save the Queen was playing. You had to. 
And at, at a very young age, one day I refused to. There was a Charlie Chaplin film on. I was actually thrown out of the cinema on a Saturday morning. So there was this whole urge to be able to see and express things in a society where these things were curtailed. Uh, quite an important um, thing, because quite a lot of ordinary British people have no idea how much censorship went on under their rule in all of these countries. But I also knew, largely from my um, um, father, how, you know, the, in, in 1690, the whole kind of newspaper fervor, 1690, pamphlets were being written, things were being passed around. And by 17, the 1750s in Britain, there were regular newspapers in Liverpool, Manchester, Nottingham, Coventry, Birmingham, Exeter, Sherborne, Salisbury, Lewis, Bristol, Canterbury, Reading, Ipswich, Cambridge, Oxford, Stamford, Leicester, Leeds, York, Newcastle, Worcester, and Derby. Since 1750, this is a nation excited by, by, by news. Um, and I knew that, and I was consumed with this idea of newspapers. But as Wakar said, you know, the newspaper business is a very nepotistic business even now. And if you are an outsider, you, 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 you don't necessarily know how to get into it. And I don't think, frankly, even now, the newspaper industry has changed that much. <coughs> when do you see many adverts in the newspapers? for jobs even on my newspaper. You know, it's, it's a difficult business. But the, so the two things, being an outsider, insider, from birth really, and then coming to this country, and then having this passion for journalism, these were the two things that kind of have never gone away, although life took me in a different direction after Oxford for many years. Um, and the reason I now choose to speak on the subject I've chosen to is because I am extremely worried about where journalism has gone in this country. Much of it is thoroughly adm admirable. Some of my greatest heroes are print journalists, um, dead and alive. Um, but I think it is now clear to most people in this country that journalism has been forced, forced, compelled by the hacking scandal and Leveson to look at itself and, and its impact on politics and the people. I don't think we have ever, ever done this. Um, and I think that's been our big problem. Um, every sector, every activity, every institution, every individual possibly, <coughs> needs a reality check from time to time to reflect, to debate, to scrutinize its practices, its habits and its values. Parliament um, had to do this after the expenses row. I'm using more recent examples, but there have been many moments in the history of Parliament when parliamentarians have been forced to examine themselves, and it's a very good thing too. The police had to examine themselves seriously after the Stephen Lawrence McPherson report was published. And I thought it was a very important historical moment of soul searching. The army is going through a soul searching period now as um, there are allegations of brutality um, to Iraqi civilians during that war and some of the cases now being taken up. The BBC is forever having to do this, but particularly after the Hutton report, had to sit down and really work out what it did wrong, what it did right, what its enemies were saying, but what its friends were saying, which were some unpalatable truths. And governments, of course, have to do this all the time. They don't, but they do need to look at how <coughs> they're being, they're behaving and how, how what they're doing is affecting politics and the people. So in a way, the question is, why hasn't journalism felt the need to go through any self-examination 
um, and has been so content, British journalism I'm talking about, to believe and say all the time that we have the best press in the world. And that this curious thing that I'm still told, that the bad comes with the good, and that it, it's only, you know, when you understand that it's the bastion of freedom of expression in this country. Um, or as um, Tom Stoppard, the playwright, wrote in my, my newspaper, The Independent, um, this idea that journalism puts out about itself, that junk journalism is the price you pay for the better stuff, the stuff that matters, that this is a trade-off. Um, uh, and as he wrote, and he's right, that you, know, you can't keep arguing this position anymore. Nobody believes it because there's been too much damage done by the junk journalism. And it's in a sense staining the excellent, important uh, journalism that any democracy needs. So in fact, the opposite is happening. The junk is staining the good. And it's not, the, the good is not carrying the junk. And as Tom Stoppard says, a free press has to be a respected press. A free press has to be not a rogue press, but a respected press, because in the end, if the trust is broken, and I think, as Leveson said, trust was broken and continues in some ways to be broken, um, then you, know, you, you are, in a sense, breaking the backbone of this incredibly important and vital and vivacious um, sector of the media. You know, whatever people say about the power of television, and of course, I only have to appear two minutes on television and everybody stops you in a supermarket, and I can write 5,000 words and I'll be lucky if, you know, somebody remembers what I've written. Nevertheless, the newspapers set the agenda. They will all tell you that. Which newspaper these days? I don't need to tell you. Um, but the, the newspapers set the agenda. And so we, the broadcasters, always, always, the Today program could not be what it is, were they not all avidly nowadays reading the Daily Mail, which they do. Um, they love the Daily Mail on the Today program. And the agenda is set. So I think the, I don't think we're in a very good period of newspapers and possibly we might be the last generation to have newspapers as we understand them. But nevertheless, the importance of it is, is un not understood, I think, by the younger generation in particular, who think everything that matters is on the web. Um, it is and it isn't, because the credibility, I am astonished, I'm astonished how many young people write to me every week wanting to be print journalists, which both kind of really reassures me, but depresses me, because there are no jobs out there, frankly, for people in my bit of the media. But how wonderful that they who have access to all this stuff on the web still want to see their name in print on a real newspaper to keep in their cupboards and show their grandfathers. You know, it's, a, it's an ex extraordinary thing, a very um, exciting uh, experience when you, when you see your work in print. I've put some quotes up because um, they kind of cover quite a lot of what I'm going to talk about. <coughs> the good and the bad of journalism. But the one I most want to focus on is George Orwell's very important quote. The journalism is printing what someone does not want printed. All else is public relations. All else is PR. And I'm going to come back to that because that is really the, the main um, part of my talk to you. For too long, and longer than we think actually, you, you look back, and Oscar Wilde thought journalism was pretty evil, nasty stuff. You go further back and you know, to the 17th century and you, people always had this view that journalists like myself come in and do what we're doing in a very heartless way and actually don't care at all what the results are, the consequences are for the people we've kind of 
been parasites on. Um, and I think there is some truth in it. There's no, no denying that it takes a special kind of person to be a journalist. And often not a very nice kind of person, I have to say. You have to be curious, you have to be driven. But if I'm honest, there have been times in my long life when I knew it, I was driven by the story. It was the story I wanted. I didn't care about the person behind the story. It is this kind of thing journalists seem to have. Um, even though I've never trained as a journalist, I'm a completely self-taught journalist, you acquire, you have this thing that you want the story come what may. And sometimes, sometimes, you do hurt people along the way. You do. Um, and there's no getting away from that. After, I mean, the, the other quote I think um, that I love is the one by Stanley Baldwin. Is it up there? Oh, I've got it here, who was the Prime Minister. He said, and I think this is also true, and I include myself, journalists enjoy the power of harlots, power without responsibility. And I think there's some truth in that too. And the best journalist, I mean, I, you know, no names, but one of the journalists I most admire, foreign correspondent, once told me how he had written this rather brilliant story um, and exposed the family he was talking to in the Lebanon to some very serious dangers. And afterwards, afterwards, when they were in trouble, he regretted it. But I remember him saying, it's like a drug. When you're doing the story, all you want is for them to tell you what you want to hear so you can put it into your story. And it's like photographers, press photographers are the same. They want that moment. And you often think, you watched that child die. You took up a photograph. Did you do anything to help the child? And of course, this is the, the, the side of journalism we journalists don't like to talk about. But I think we should. What we do is important. What we do is often honorable. But often, the way we sometimes behave <coughs> is not. Um, and um, in, in Andrew Marr um, wrote a book about what he called it My Trade. And he quoted um, a, a, a very se severe critic of the predatory journalism that I've sort of slightly been talking about. And she said, every journalist who is not too stupid or full of himself to notice what is going on knows that what he does is morally indispensable. He is a kind of confidence man, preying upon people's vanity, ignorance, and loneliness, gaining their trust, and betraying them without remorse. I'm being very hard on my profession, only in order to tell you that in spite of all that, I truly love being a journalist. I think it's a vital and most exciting and most um, stimulating, and in a, in, in a democracy sometimes, a, a cornerstone of accountability. Um, I didn't become a journalist until I was in my late 30s. And so perhaps that's why I still have retain a romantic view of it. But I do believe very strongly that in spite of all the criticisms, a country without free and good journalism is a poor country, an oppressed country. And we've, we've seen these countries and see them today. Um, and I think it is by acknowledging what's wrong with it that I hope to also give you a sense of why I absolutely am committed to the work I do and why I've spent so long doing it and why I so wanted to be a journalist from a very young age. I have a very rich uncle and he's still, you know, he's getting very old now. And every time he sees me, he says, what rubbish did you do with your big brain? What, what a mess you made with your life. If you had gone into business like I went into business, you'd have a big house in Harrow and three shops like me. And he's right. Of course he's right. It's a rubbish thing to go into. I'll never be rich. It's a, a job which has no security, but it is a job that, like Andrew Marr writes in his book, it's an itch. If you feel it, you've got to do it. 
most of us don't get rich being journalists. We do it because we believe in it. Um, and it does a lot of good. Let me give you a few examples. Um, the Independent and The Guardian. And actually, many people on the Daily Mail, surprisingly, during the time when um, Tony Blair was taking us to war, they did, they did not ever stop criticizing him, asking him questions, objecting to the war. They never surrendered to his power over them. He had a lot of power over journalists, Tony Blair. But what was interesting was that this, these papers, and you wouldn't expect the mail to be part of what I'm talking about, but they did not let power carry on a, a kind of war policy which they were not persuaded was needed, necessary, or based on a truth. Um, the Telegraph exposed the expenses scandal. We would, none of us, it wasn't broadcasters. It was the Telegraph which bought the, 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 the CD, I think, which had all the information, which <coughs> broke the story of the uh, uh, MP's expenses. Um, the Daily Mail, again, when the Lawrence killers were, were not facing justice, remember they put the faces of the men on their front page. They've done a lot that's wrong and continue to do so. But there are moments um, when even that paper has done some good. I remember there was this one morning, one Sunday, um, when... I was, I write my column on a Sunday for Monday, and I had this email from somebody called Colin Firth, this was about five years ago, saying, please, could you ring me? I'm in Vancouver, and I'm desperate to talk to you because I want you to write about this family that's about to be deported to the Congo. And if you and I write about it, maybe we can stop them getting on the plane on Monday evening. So I, I, I said, are you the Colin Firth? <laughs> and he very shyly said yes. Um, and we did it. So I wrote my column. He wrote, um, uh, he agreed to be interviewed by one of our reporters. And we did a news story. And we got this family off the plane on Monday evening, just as they were going to be put on. Because even a small paper like The Independent, having his name behind it, you know, the, uh, the Home Office capitulated. So the, there is immense power in, in, in this, the, the printed sector. And, um, it, you know, it's not always used wisely, but it is. Ha all right, so this question now, the insider-outsider, why do I think it's important? The questions we need to ask are, what is the role and duty, yes, duty, of a journalist in a healthy democracy? Why are so many journalists not detached from power, but in bed with it? And how does that affect their judgment and independence? As I said, Orwell was absolutely right when he said, journalism is printing what someone else um, does not want printed. Everything else is PR. Sadly, now, in the times we are now living in, and in over the last 10 years, maybe longer, maybe even going back to the Thatcher era, too often what is printed is what the government wants printed, or the prime minister wants printed, or his spin doctor wants printed, or her spin doctor wants. I think it was started by Margaret Thatcher with uh, Bernard Ingham, when he was the kind of bulldog pusher of angles and a bully and, and Alistair Campbell who came after him be, took up that same uh, personality. And I think that's what the problem is today, that so much of what we read is what other people want printed. Too many journalists and the too many journalists who are praised and who are promoted and who are paid huge amounts of money are not insider, outsider journalists, but insider, insider journalists. Um, and, and by doing what is expected, their careers flourish. Um, Kurt and I were talking about some of this just a couple of hours ago, that there is a lot of dividend 
um, if you actually go with the political mood of the moment. At the moment, it's not very wise to say, actually, Margaret Thatcher was one of the worst things to happen to this country. It, it's not wise, because the mood of the country is pushing us in one direction. So when somebody like me writes a column today saying, actually, you know what? I remember how many black men died in custody then. I remember how the police treated her. I remember how she welcomed white Zimbabweans and wanted to keep the rest of us out. I remember how the day my son was born on the 30th of January 1978, on that very day, she made a speech saying her country was um, swamped by too many other cultures. So, you know, I wrote that today and I was punished for it duly by all her fans, but, you know, the most successful journalists, and sometimes they're even journalists on the left, sort of have a sixth sense of how to please power. And it still astonishes me that there are journalists, so-called journalists on the left, who supported the war on Iraq and have never retracted and are given huge prizes and given wonderful jobs and broadcasting series on the BBC. But there is, they're very good at catching the, the zeitgeist, I think. I don't think that makes a good journalist. Um, I th there are four, f I'll go through these quite quickly, but I just wanted to tell, give you an idea of what I'm talking about. The government insider journalism is best represented for me by the lobby system. I think to have a system where certain privileged uh, journalists, until recently all men, most of them from Oxbridge, have privileged access to politicians in government while the rest are kept out, and they wine and dine together, is to me nothing short of corruption. Now, there are some very good lobby journalists, and I'm not personally attacking them. I think the system is wrong, and when you have wined and dined and spent all this time together in the same club, you simply can't be objective and distant from power. And too often, politicians feed these friendly journalists, an awful lot of stuff that you and I then read, um, which is what they want printed, not what they don't want printed. Um, and it's something my paper, The Independent, in the first years of its life, refused to join the lobby system. In the end, it had to, because politicians just would not give our journalists any interviews, solid interviews. And I think it's a really rotten system and one we should be questioning very much more than we do. Um, of course, it's natural. It's completely natural. You're spending so much time together. Sometimes you're even sleeping with each other. How are you then going to write these strong stories about what government is doing wrong? How on earth is that possible? Um, so for a good democracy, and I think ours is a good dem democracy, sometimes not as good as it should be. We need to question the lobby system. And we need to question the power that people like Alistair Campbell, Andy Coulson, and um, Bernard Ingham have over uh, newspapers, the power and, and broadcasters. The bullying, the way they managed to tame really strong journalists was, I think, a scandal under Blair and under Thatcher. And at the moment, I'm not sure what's happening. It's much quieter since Colson's gone from the coalition government. But, you know, these are the guys who are really coming in there to manipulate the news on behalf of, their gov of the government. And it, it really isn't very good for us to get objective information. I think the same applies to institutions, and sometimes good institutions. Um, you know, how they somehow gain access and gain privileges and become voices of authority without proper interrogation. Like I said, sometimes they're good organizations, you know. Um, sometimes I think they need more scrutiny. Why, I ask myself, is Migration Watch and Sir Andrew Green on the Today program, on the BBC, 
saying what he uh, and his um, institution believes. And we never have serious interrogation of those views. That has become the truth. And I really think there's been a failure o o on the part of the media to inter we, we have no idea who the backers are of Migration Watch. Maybe it's a v wonderful, extraordinarily honest institution, probably is, but we still need proper interrogation of it. Doesn't happen. On the other hand, human rights organizations are mercilessly attacked, um, or European um, uh, institutions, as if every European institution is by definition corrupt and wrong and wasteful and needs to go. So there's a lot of bias, a lot of bias, and a lot of insider, insider, and outsider, outsider um, um, kind of game going on when it comes to institutions. Some organizations and institutions play journalists. The banking sector, I would argue, has become very clever at managing, as they call, uh, the press and the media. Some Muslim organizations have become very clever at managing journalists uh, and, and, and managing to get some friendly journalists, particularly on the left, never to ask the difficult questions. And I think this is just as wrong. I think every organization, every institution, minority or majority, needs to be interrogated properly. Um, uh, and so on. We have nationwide advice centers, which at the moment are failing massively. But because they have a good, kind of a good image that these are nice people where desperate people go to for advice about rent and benefits, nobody's scrutinizing how poor is the service provided by the advice sector. Um, so. I'm, uh, what I'm saying is that there comes a point when you realize that some people get away with it in our media, uh, in, in, in our democracy, and while others don't. And I think there needs to be a much, much more universal, if you like, um, um, set of tools with which we uh, approach organizations and institutions. War is the biggest and most serious thing of all when it comes to insider, outsider journalism. There are not many people here who will remember this, but I remember it and will never forget her. A, a teacher from Sirencester called Diana Gold, who was on television um, talking about the Falklands War with Mrs. Thatcher. No journalist had managed to ask Margaret Thatcher the questions that needed to be asked. This teacher from Sirencester, she died last year, asked her such relentless questions about the Belgrano. The Belgrano was um, the Argentinian uh, boat we sank, which Margaret Thatcher had always implied was in the exclusion zone and a threat to us. This woman, an outsider, outsider on television got her to admit that the Belgrano was sailing away from the exclusion zone and was no threat. How ashamed should that have made us journalists feel that it took a teacher to be brave enough and f independent minded enough to ask that question. Um, we know how many times with the Gulf War and the Iraq War and with Afghanistan um, Famous journalists, uh, rewarded journalists, became embedded journalists. So they were part of the project, not independent of the project. If you look back at the Vietnam War, this didn't happen. The Vietnam War was lost partly because independent American journalists refused to tell the story the American nation wanted them, a uh, state wanted them to. They broke out and they did what they did and turned public opinion against the Vietnam War. After that, lessons were learned and states became very committed to the idea of embedded journalism, no free journalism. We have to control information. And so they did. So they did. We still don't know what has happened 
or what happened, what they did in Fallujah. The information about Fallujah has never been revealed. Once in a while, I saw a Sky TV report a few, uh, a year or so ago, interviewing a doctor in Fallujah who said and showed us the number of babies being born with the most grotesque, grotesque deformities. One child even had sort of two halves of a head. Otherwise, there is a blackout. We have no idea what they did in Fallujah. They punished Fallujah. But we have no idea what they did. No journalist has told us. Um, we uh, know the lies that were told over the Iraq war. I think then journalists, quite a lot of journalists, behaved bravely and did resist the official line. Um, but, you know, with quite a lot of other information, after we went into Iraq, there was hardly anything coming back at us. Robert Fisk, the great journalist, and a few others did tell us what was going on at great personal cost to themselves and refused to be embedded journalists. Today, there are drone attacks killing scores, hundreds of people in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Okay? Nobody here, no journalist in this country is following this story adequately. And it was only in last week's Time magazine that I saw a wonderful article about how American public opinion is now turning against drone attacks and they're beginning to ask questions there because some journalists are actually being brave enough to say, why are we going and killing wedding parties? Um, and why are we not accountable for these deaths? Why do we not even have numbers for the people we are killing, let alone names? Um, so, it, you know, this is a very dangerous thing when journalism has lost its independence, its sharp eye, its sharp tongue. North Korea. Um, yes, North Korea shouldn't have uh, nuclear weapons, but nor should we and nor should the US, and nor should Israel. That game that some people can have, uh, can stockpile these weapons that could destroy the world, while others have to be held to account, is no longer going to work. So where are the investigative journalists who can tell us where the stockpiling is going on? Who's doing the stockpiling? Only one journalist I'd know of, called uh, Olenka Frank Franklin of the BBC, was brave enough to go into Israel and make a fantastic program about the nuclear weaponry in Israel. And the BBC, instead of putting it out at the time it was supposed to go out, around 9 o'clock, only showed it at midnight. So, you know, there's a problem here. The language we use, I mean, I couldn't believe that people were mourning um, the um, departure of David Miliband from politics, okay? Almost every newspaper. Did they, none of them remember <laughs> his role in the Iraq war? Did no one care to even recall that there are allegations that he knew about rendition? How come these things disappear from the minds of journalists because they want to be insider insiders? They don't want to rock the boat. Um, we don't, still don't know properly how many numbers of, uh, of casualties and deaths there were in Iraq. The only people who told us, the only people who told us, or the only place you found out, was, was it the BMJ? It was one of the medical journals. It was the Lancet. It was the Lancet that told us the numbers. In all the coverage we've had, we still have no proper assessments. Last area I want to look at um, is goodies journalism, the insider and outsider, the, the goodies journalism, which is perhaps less serious than war, but just as corrupting. So I get every week. Do you want to go to um, Trinidad, all expenses paid, and come back and write about it? Uh, would you like to come to this screening um, and a champagne reception afterwards? Um, uh, Please come to this new restaurant, all expenses paid. 
okay? Every week, these goodies come uh, your way. Um, and I'll be honest, sometimes I go to the screenings and drink their champagne. And sometimes I go to the restaurants. But do I? I have never, I have never, and this is something I feel very strongly about, I have never translated the treat into copy. I just have not because I think that is so corrupting. And we have a very famous uh, travel writer on The Independent called Simon Cole, Cole, I'm forgetting his name, Calder, um, who never ever takes a freebie. So now his great you, you know, um, uh, selling point is the man who pays his own way. And so people read his articles because they can trust him because he didn't get a freebie. Perfumes, all these things, have become the way the media works. And PR rules. This is PR. This is not journalism. The magazines young people read today are entirely PR. The interviews with stars, well, do you want to interview Justin Bieber? Yes, well, here, you can ask these questions, you can't ask these questions, you have seven minutes, and we'll bring our own photographer. And then you see this copy. It is a fantasy. It is more fictionalized than fiction. Um, consumer ethics, consumer testing <coughs> ethics, which were established by which magazine, okay, were important. So when people wanted to know what fridge to buy, they could trust a magazine which wasn't kind of you know, uh, <coughs> becoming a PR agent for any particular company. Well, now, of course, all the magazines will give you this or that advice. Um, except for good housekeeping, which I think is quite ethical still in terms of its testing of products. Everything else has become who's got the best PR. So I think journalism is in a bad way. The best is still very good, but too much of the rest, and most perhaps, journalism is, is, is a result of PR of people printing what somebody wants printed, and nicely, and happily, uh, and decoratively, and not enough of the gutsy refusal to do that that George Orwell was talking about. There are, of course, still wonderful journalists who tell the truth. Robert Fisk, um, Henry Porter, uh, who writes in The Observer, I think on our paper we've got Owen Jones, who's a young writer who defends the working classes of this country, Jon Snow, um, many BBC journalists, brilliant, and Gary Young. I'm not dissing my own profession, um, but I am saying that when I look at where we are now, it really worries me that that independent spirit which actually started here with the civil war in Britain between the Royalists and Cromwell's lot and was very political and was incredibly kind of trying to do the right thing, whichever side it was on, has become extremely compromised. Because that central idea that Orwell is so strong on, everybody's become an insider, insider, and has lost the outsider's eye. And I don't think that is good or right. I want to end with just two very short points. Um, when I talked about community uh, loyalties, you cannot be a journalist and be loyal. The first promise you have to make to yourself and to your readers is that you will not be loyal to anyone. You will not be patriotic. You will not unthinkingly take this side or that side. One of the hardest things is, of course, when you're a journalist and you are from a minority background, that a part of you feels very protective about your people and angry at the racism and at the needless attacks that are um, made against Muslims, black people, women, and so on. And you do your best to protect them with your writing. But in the end, you also have to be able to be critical of the most oppressed community too. You have to do it fairly, you have to do it justly, you have to do it right. But it just can't be um, a, 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 an agreement that you make with people that you will only run 
good news about them and never look at the dark side of all of our lives. Um, and that is, again, about having a mindset which is not that of an insider, but an insider-outsider. And it is one of the hardest things you can ever do. Sometimes I feel terrible when I've written about, uh, you know, oh, I don't know, uh, an attack on young white girls by a group of men from Bradford who happen to be from Pakistan. I feel terrible about it because I know I will get the racism as well as the whole community. But I'm a journalist and I have to do it. But I have to do it fairly and I have to do it right. And I, what I do then is say, Jimmy Savile wasn't a Muslim. And you know, try and come back at them saying this is a universal thing. But we can't protect people. Um, and there is too much of that too um, in the world of journalism. But thank you. These are my thoughts on why I think journalism needs to shape up. Thank you.